Well, thanks so much for, um, for inviting me and also thanks for um, doing two things. One is I don't like the cost of cancer care to be in the for form of a debate, which is what I'm going to do next month with the ASCO, because that's like debating whether the earth is round or flat. I, I don't want to debate that. I mean, this is a problem, and it, I'm glad that uh, Mohammed and I, Aaron have uh, recognized that and put this as a lecture rather than as a debate, because we can tend to get lost in the issues if we do it as a debate. And secondly, for just allowing me to speak, because it's, it is taking a risk just putting me on stage here, because many of the companies uh, uh, that fund us for our meetings are watching as well. I was very proud to write this paper with Jean-Luc. Uh, Jean-Luc has already heard my presentation and he had to leave. Uh, I gave it to him pri for privately. Uh, Jean-Luc and I were asked by blood to write this article on a pharmacoeconomic perspective of myeloma. And I'll just tell you, in the last three days, we've heard many talks on how to treat multiple myeloma, and that's covered in this paper in terms of what is the ideal treatment for multiple myeloma today. If we had all of the money that is available in the world, uh, how would we treat myeloma? We would give induction, transplant, maintenance therapy. When the patient relapses, we have DARA RD, ICSA RD, LEN RD. You can name everything you want and you can, you can do it. But in this paper, we also go into the problems of can we really afford it? Can everybody in the world really be able to give this kind of treatment? Why are the costs so high and what we can do about it? These are some of the facts. The number of new cases in multiple myeloma in 2017 in the United States alone is 30,000. The total lifetime cost of treating these 30,000 patients, just for these 30,000 patients diagnosed in 2017, is $22.4 billion. <clears throat> This is just the drug cost. It excludes hospital costs, infusion costs, laboratory costs, imaging costs, physician costs, nursing costs, ancillary costs, supportive care costs. So what is going on? What is going on is this. Every drug that we have is expensive. Uh, this includes thalidomide, which is coming in at $60,000 a year in the US, lenalidomide, $168,000, and you can go down the list well, even cyclophosphamide is expensive, $5,800. Cyclophosphamide used to be $16 per 500 milligram dosing uh, just a few years ago. Today in the US, 500 milligrams of cyclophosphamide cost $100. That's gone up by five times. So that's why it's cost 5,800. If you look at regimens, when we mix regimens together, then the cost goes up quite a bit. Um, Bortezomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, VRD, which we would think as the standard of care, if you give one year of VRD, that's $220,000. After that, of course, we will be giving $168,000 worth of lenalidomide every year as maintenance therapy, so you can estimate how easily the costs add up uh, to more than a million dollars per patient with multiple myeloma. The new drugs, as they come in, and as we embrace four drug regimens and maybe perhaps five drug regimens, then the cost will go up to even half a million dollar per year for just giving DARA KRD. One week of VRD, and I can buy the two latest, two of the latest iPhone 10s. And I'll have extra money to buy all of the old models on eBay. And I will have enough money to buy beautiful headsets to listen to this uh, phone with. And this is just the beginning, because these drugs, all of which are priced high, there's more yet to come. Every new drug that we're going to have, that all of us have been talking about, from isatuximab to philanacib to LGH447 to dinocyclib, and why should I even mention CAR-T? All of these are going to be extraordinarily high-priced, out of the reach of most people. The problem is even bigger when you think that myeloma is just 1% of all cancers. The same story is playing out in lung cancer, in breast cancer, in prostate cancer, in colon cancer. And it's not like an automobile accident that if you drive very safely, you can go through your whole lifetime without getting into a major car accident. This is going to affect most of us. 
all of us are going to have some family member or us personally affected with cancer. Because one in three people in the world get cancer, and all of the cancer drugs approved since 2014 in the United States cost more than $120,000 per year, all of them. And the per capita income for a household, even in the US, is 52,000. It's lower in other countries. Uh, so you can imagine that four people have to work to just pay for one person's cancer treatment. Now, it's not just, some of these are unique to the US. It may be playing out in other countries, I'm not sure. But this is a real life story that happened in the United States, where this is not a problem with just the, old, the brand new drugs. This is daraprim, or pyrimethamine. Pyrimethamine was manufactured in 1952, or something like that, 1950s. Pyrimethamine used to cost $13.50 per tablet. The price was increased overnight to $750 per tablet. That was just a few years ago, by Turing Pharmaceuticals, which bought the drug. And this guy, Martin Shkreli, who was the CEO of the company which did that, he defended this in Congress, and he defended this everywhere, saying that this is completely legal, which is correct, because it is completely legal to do that. Martin Shkreli is now in jail for, not because he raised the price of Daraprim. He committed securities fraud, and he's in jail for something else. The price of Daraprim, if you go to goodrx.com and Google it, it's still the same. It costs $4,400 for six tablets at Costco with a coupon. You look at life in the last 20 years for the whole world. This is from 1997 to 2070. You can see that, oh, some things have really not changed in price. New cars, household, furnishing, clothing, those have remained the same. Some things have become better. Cell phones cost less. Electronics and toys, electronic toys, they all cost less. TVs cost less, very less. In fact, the TV never ceases to amaze me. I have this amazing TV which gives 4K resolution picture. I can almost see the person's skin lesions <laughs> from, from, from sitting way back in my couch. And that magnificent piece of equipment I can buy for like $800. Some things have gone pricier. Hospital services, colleges, college tuition, textbooks, some of them have risen in price with time. Do you know what this line is? That's gone up way over the top. This was from Twitter by a person called Ali Ad Lolly Daggle. It's been retweeted many, many times now. It's this absolute truth. This drug, can anyone guess what this amazing drug is? This is the price of insulin. Insulin in the last 20 years in the United States has gone up that much. I could draw this curve with many, many of our drugs that we use. Prices go up annually, far more than inflation. This is 1,000 price increase in insulin, which is a life-saving drug. Insulin-dependent diabetics will die without this drug. So the question is, we can ask, why are prices so high? Why is this iPhone not one million? Why is it only $800? Why are drug prices so high? So to understand this, you really need to get into depths. I would encourage you to read uh, our papers published by Peter Bach, by Vinay Prasad, by Jean-Luc Caruso, by uh, Hagop Kantarjian. They get into details of why this is happening, and it affects everybody, and I'll show you why it affects everyone. Number one reason why the prices are so high is monopoly. We give patent protection. If I have a monopoly on water, and only I can sell water, then I, you can bet I will charge a very high price for it. What we are doing to pharmaceutical companies is basically giving them 10 years, 15 years patent protection on a drug, which is life-saving, which is not like television you can live without. It's something you need. If you're a cancer patient, you absolutely need daratumumab. You absolutely need lenalidomide. You cannot live without it. Therefore, you will buy it at whatever price it comes. And it's a monopoly because no matter if that I have lenalidomide, bortezomib, dexamethasone, uh, I have melphalan, cyclophosphamide. It's still a monopoly for daratumumab because this is, these are not curable diseases. You will have patients who will use up all these five drugs and then what do you have? Then you have to use the daratumumab. So they know that you have to come to them. So daratumumab is a monopoly and so will panabinostat be a monopoly. And each drug that we have for incurable conditions is a monopoly. 
Monopoly alone is not the problem. Companies have perfected the art of sustaining the monopoly by basically making sure that they delay the arrival of generics, they delay the arrival of products that can compete with these drugs. And the clever thing that they do is by using uh, smaller trials, other trials, regulatory designs. By the time you think I should use this particular drug and this is going generic and so the drug's going to become cheap, they convince you that that is really old news. You should really not be using imatinib to treat CML because that's a very old drug. You should really be using, you know, nilotinib or bosutinib or some other drug which is even better, gives you greater MRD rate, negative rates, it's, it's uh, far more tolerable or some reason by which you're persuaded to use the newer product so they can sustain the monopoly. They also pay the generics off to say that you cannot introduce the drug because if you do, I will sue you. If you don't, I'll give you money, so then you can delay the generic. Cost of de drug development is high, and some of it is our own doing. We just in, uh, insist on such perfect data that to generate that perfect data takes hundreds of millions of dollars. And then the seriousness of cancer, and this is what bothers me the most. Cancer is such a serious disease, myeloma is such a serious disease, that we are willing to do anything for our loved one. If somebody has myeloma in your family or cancer in your family, how many of us will not sell your house or you know, sell your valuables and somehow find a way to pay or save their lives? So it's a serious disease that people are willing to pay whatever it takes. Countries are willing to pay whatever it takes for their citizens. That still explains why prices are high, but it doesn't explain why prices are insanely high, like you saw with the insulin. Insanely high is basically because of certain factors that are fairly unique to the United States. Number one is, like, imagine France, where if a drug is approved, the health authorities will then negotiate the price to see, you know, to make sure that the company doesn't charge $200,000 per year for a drug that only gives six months benefit. So they'll say, well, you're, for six months benefit, we can pay you 50,000, 60,000. For one year, we'll pay you 100,000. So some amount of negotiation is there because basically the government is buying drugs so that they can give it to its citizens for free. Medicare does the same thing. Medicare buys drugs and gives it to its citizens for free. But Medicare is prevented by law from negotiating with pharma. There is no health authority. So imagine France without the health authorities, and then what the prices of drugs will be. That's what's happening in the US, number one. Number two, you can import alcohol, you can import cigarettes, they harm you, but you cannot import drugs. So if you're a patient dying because you don't have drug access, but you can go to India and buy the drug for 100 the price, that is illegal. You could get stopped by customs and you could pay a fine or go to jail, I don't know. I haven't tried that. Number three, the reimbursement system in the U.S. encourages people to give the most expensive option. Why? Because many doctors in private practice, particularly oncologists give, who give chemotherapy, they can mark up the price of the drug by 6%. That's average sales price plus 6% is the reimbursement. So if you wanted to give a $50 drug or $5,000 drug and both are equal, which one would you give? The $5,000 drug means you can take home several hundred dollars back. $50 drug, you might take home five bucks if you're lucky. So what happens is the system of reimbursement is set up to encourage doctors to give the more expensive option. And there are studies that show that doctors do do that, unfortunately. We are all human, so when you have a huge amount of money difference, then that's what happens. There's also liberal off-label use in the U.S. You can use thalidomide, which was approved in leprosy for myeloma. You can use, you know, lenalidomide, which is approved for one thing for another thing. You can use um, borinostat to treat myeloma. You can use venetoclax to treat myeloma. You can use off-label treatment. And off-label also in situations. So, for example, KRD is not approved as frontline in the U.S., but if somebody from here says KRD is a great regimen, tomorrow some doctor in, in the U.S. can actually go home and give KRD to their patients. That's perfectly fine. And then there's no equivalent of the health authorities, as I mentioned. Plus, the problem is compounded by the fact that there are no allies. There are very few physicians willing to challenge pharma. Why? Because physicians who are in practice, they, are, they do benefit from high prices. Physicians who are experts, well, we are conflicted. 
we take a lot of money from pharmaceutical companies, from ad boards, honorarias, running trials. So it's very hard to take on pharma. Organizations, well, that's why I applauded uh, Mohammed and Aaron. Organizations, you can look at the exhibit halls at various professional meetings that we go to and how much drug money comes in. The very few organizations, they will fight for various things, but they'll never go to Congress and say, like, you absolutely have to pass a law to lower the price of drugs. They can say soft things, but not hard things like that. Profe patient organizations, same thing. Patients, the same thing, because many patients who are insured, they are able to get the drugs for lower costs, so it, it really doesn't, uh, I mean, they really do, are not up in arms if they are getting the drug paid for pretty much. And the patients who are not having the wealth enough to get those drugs, they, well, they are too poor to protest. Patient care organizations is the same thing. Well, even insurance companies. You would think insurance companies will be upset that the prices are so high. Well, turns out they're not, because as long as the premiums can be priced, they can still make a profit. All you need to make sure is that it's predictable. It cost me $1 billion this year, then I'll divide it by the number of people I need to insure, change my premiums accordingly, and I'm making a profit. It doesn't matter what the price is. As long as don't, don't change it suddenly to two billion the next year. Make it slow. So what can we do? What can we do? Well, we are, as physicians, I don't know what we can do, but let's see. I think certain things have to happen, and they have to happen in the US. Number one is there has to be value-based pricing like they have in all of the other developed countries. Australia, Europe, UK, Canada all have value-based pricing so that if a drug prolongs survival by one week, well, then that drug cannot be priced the same as a drug that prolongs life by one year. You have to have some tie to value in terms of the cost. Number two, Medicare has to be allowed to negotiate. I was at a healthcare human services forum where most top people said that the one single most important thing that the U.S. has to do is to allow Medicare to negotiate price of new, prices of drugs. Number three, we need to be able to allow True free market, which means you can buy and bring, import things from various countries, just like we do with televisions, electronics, just, you're taking the risk. It's your, your body, you're taking the risk, at least for personal. Pardon? Trump is the solution to all of that. And finally, all of, the, all of the countries can do this, which is facilitate easy entry of generics and biosimilars so that we can have some real competition. When real competition happens, prices do fall. So for example, imatinib is still very expensive in the US, but I believe imatinib is very cheap in Poland because they have 19 generics. So then there is true competition between the drugs and the drug prices are low. So we need true generic competition. But those are things that are beyond us. I mean, Trump may be able to do it, Congress may be able to do it. It is an act of Congress, which is harder than act of God. But we cannot, as physicians, do anything about the previous things. So my final few slides will be what we can do, both as practicing clinicians and as experts. Number one, we have to choose the best option. We cannot just always want to give everything to that is unreasonable. We have to choose the best possible option, and that means we have to maybe sometimes make compromises. For example, you could just use VCD instead of VRD, and that will save you uh, uh, at least $150,000 in cost. VTD, same, similar. Instead of giving maintenance indefinitely, maybe one or two years, stop and watch closely. If, if, if we had the resources, we'll do indefinite maintenance, but if we don't have the resources, we may have to do some of these things. We may have to use consolidation instead of maintenance, and so on. Uh, in some countries, transplant is very uh, inexpensive relative to the cost of the drugs. In some other countries, transplant is dangerous to do, but the drugs are very cheap. So you, depending on the country, you may have to prefer one or the other and not be wedded to one thing. That's the first thing we can do. Number two, I'm speaking in France, and many of the things that I've told you might be unique to the US. But it's really important for you to recognize, and that's so easy to do because all you have to do is recognize. Just recognize how US drug prices matter worldwide. The global cancer spending just on drug cancer drugs is estimated at $100 billion of US dollars each year. $100 billion is what costs each year in drug, cancer drug costs. 
of which the United States is 46% of that market. France will probably be there. So, imagine if you are a drug company and the French health authorities say, that drug is too expensive, we cannot pay that much, lower the price. It's very easy for the company to walk away because they can say, well, then too bad, you won't have, the, you won't have my drug. And they can walk away because whatever they little bit that they lose in France, they can always make it up in the US. They can in increase the price year after year and make it up. So what happens in the US, US drug policies affects all of you, wherever you are, whether you're in Europe or in Canada, it, that, it does affect everyone. So it's important that we are aware how US policies affect uh, cost of drugs elsewhere. That means we have to generate careful, powerful guidelines as experts. We cannot be very um, superficial about the guidelines. We cannot say that you could use any of these 10 drugs because that just opens the door to uh, people using the most expensive options. For example, what we say matters, why? The average sales price of botezomib is $50,000. If I choose botezomib, then I will be able to take home $3,000 per year just by using botezomib. That's the 6% markup. But if I were convinced that carfilzomib was better and I should always prefer carfilzomib over botezomib, then I could easily make 130,000, I mean I could easily make $7,800, which is 6% of that. And if you, if you decided you could actually give only the higher dose of carfilzomib because that's better for you, all it takes is few experts at ASH saying that the higher dose of carfilzomib is better, and if that's what we use, then, then the doctors would be happy to do that because they can actually take home more, uh, more dollars. So whatever we say here on this is the standard of care actually matters because it affects practice everywhere. If you take regimens, you can see, if I gave just Cybor-D, the take home is 3,600, but if I gave Dara plus VRD, because everybody wants to give quadruplets, then my take home is 20,400. You don't need to convince physicians too much because national guidelines com combined with the US reimbursement system makes it very easy to justify giving the more expensive options. And the easy use of off-label ther therapy facilitates this. Now there are data for this, there are data for this. Peter Bach has done a study where he has shown that the moment irinotecan became generic, the use of the brand name oxaliplatin went up several 20% or so. Because you can make more money giving oxaliplatin than giving generic irinotecan. This has been shown time and again in Medicare reimbursement things with Taxol versus Abraxane, with other drugs where the moment you can give a high, doctors are not bad natured, but they're hearing in CME meetings that it's actually better to give Abraxane or oxaliplatin is better than irinotecan. So all they need is a little bit of reinforcement and then the monetary rewards pay for that to change practice. So we have to be very careful with the guidelines. So if we make guidelines and we say, we really do not recommend this approach, we have to take cost into account because it is more expensive and it's not really better. And therefore we recommend approach A over B. We don't recommend denosumab for all patients because it is 10 times, 20 times more expensive than zolotronic acid. We don't say statements like this is the standard of care because the standard of care has a very definite meaning to it. It means that that is what you should be doing. It doesn't mean that also can be used. So we have to also design, be very careful when we interpret studies like Alcyon, which are DARA VMP versus VMP, and then DARA versus no treatment. That could be used to get DARA tumumab approval, but that cannot be used to say that DARA is better in frontline. That requires a different study design. So we have to be very careful with not only doing the study, but being very careful in how we interpret that so that people get the right message. And we need to conduct strategic trials. Philippe also had to leave, but Philippe also listened to the talk before he left. He, I gave it to him privately as well. Philippe and I wrote a paper in The Lancet on multiple myeloma translation of trial results to reality, in which we call for strategic trials. Strategic trials means we really need to do trials where we can look at cost, look at access, look at uh, side effects, quality of life, and then 
design trials in a way that will actually inform practice. For example, if you want to use MRD to decide treatment, how nice it would be if we can say that if you, if you reach MRD negative and I randomize you to continuing the treatment versus stopping, just like they did with Gleevec, if you stop, actually patients live just as long, then you just save money. That's the trial we need to do. We need to do trials with curative strategies. That means because if you cure somebody, like six cycles of our chop and you're cured, then you don't incur any more expense. So we really need to see, can we cure myeloma? And I'm very happy that we are doing that with Caesar and Ascent. We need to really look at trials which are limited duration therapy uh, and targeted trials. What do I mean? That if we are going to design trials, this should be our holy grail. This is what we should go for. I'm going to find some regimen where you give six to 12 months of therapy and stop, and then your myeloma doesn't come back for the next 10 years. You save all that money because 10 years later, if it comes back, well, by then, hopefully, all the drugs are cheaper. And that's our motto. Going, that's the type of trials we have to design. And we need to also remember that myeloma is not one disease, and therefore, we may be able to strategically say, you know, just like you said, Jesus, I'm going to add extra treatment for MRD-positive patients, but only in the high-risk patients, because for all the others, I might just add cost or toxicity, but not benefit. But we have to really do that. To do that, we have to really look at these entities individually and decide what is unique about them, what, how can we uniquely improve the outcome of these patients. And finally, the fifth and final thing that we can all do is advocacy. We all need to partner together to try to fight for lower drug costs. I will tell you that this is not a fight against pharma. It's really not fair to pharma to blame them. Why? Because pharma is basically doing what the law allows. Um, it, it, the best analogy I can give is we have, a cook, we have a candy jar full of candy. And the parents, which is the government, has told the kid, you know, you can take all of this and eat it, and that's all fine. And then some other person like me comes and says, no, don't eat it because it's not good for you. Is the child going to listen to me? That's what we have done. Our law says you can raise the price, no problem. You can, no need to negotiate with us. You can price the same drug regardless of value. And pharma is doing whatever is allowed by the law to make sure that the shareholder return is absolutely the best that they can deliver. So it's not the problem of pharma, it's really our laws that we need to look at, re-examine, and advocate for change. This was a letter that was signed by 113 oncologists or 118 oncologists, including Hagop, Ken Anderson, I, uh, Ayelu Teferi, myself. Uh, and what we argued for was that the laws need to change. Not that pharma needs to change, but the laws need to change so that we can have reasonable prices for everyone. And I think we, we need more people to get involved with this. If you read this article, there's a petition that you can apply. Cost is not the only problem. Access is a problem. Access is a problem because regulatory authorities are different country to country, and what works in one country might not work for the others. So access is a problem, and we need to uh, worry about access as well. And finally, I think this is where most of us are torn. Most of us are torn between wearing the hat of a doctor where you want to give the best possible treatment to the patient, no matter the cost, and wearing the hat of an expert or a society where you have to look at the cost in terms of the whole picture, what it matters. And there, that's where we struggle with. And this is going to be a continued challenge because all of us do want the best for our patients. Thank you very much.